From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 11, streaming now. Good evening to you at 11 o'clock and thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Mullins. The roads are clear right now, but they could be a mess by this time tomorrow. Snow is headed our way. We want to get right to WRTV Chief Mueller's meteorologist Kevin Gregory helping you prepare for that weekend. Kevin. And Mark, it looks like once it starts tomorrow evening, the variety of weather that we have will stick around through uh, Sunday and Monday. There's the whole system playing out beginning tomorrow evening, leaving on Monday. As far as the spike in our probability of precipitation, and I use that word rather than just saying flat out snow, because there will be some rain mixed in with this southwest of Indy, but uh, as you can see, a uh, virtual guarantee in the evening and tomorrow night. Right. Three o'clock in the afternoon, just crossing the Wabash River. Here comes the blue of the snow. 5 p.m. I would say 5 p.m. through about 1 a.m. is the period when we'll see the heaviest accumulating snow, and it will be a wet heavy snow. In general, as you go north and east from Indy, that's where the three to six and the isolated higher amounts will be. As you go southwest of Indianapolis, not much at all. We'll detail this let you know what comes with the snow and how we kind of reverse things for Sunday. That's coming up. The first thing the government can do is cancel all of our rents for the rest of the pandemic. That's the demand from a group of protesters to our local, state and federal government urging them to take bold measures during this pandemic. Canceling rent and mortgages would apply to renters, homeowners, small businesses and even small landlords. The Indianapolis Party for Socialism and Liberation was behind today's protest. WRTV's Cornelius Hawker talked to them about this long shot plea to the government. With signs and a big banner, you couldn't miss the message this group of protesters was trying to get across at Friday's Cancel the Rents protest. Nobody should be scared that they're going to be kicked out of their home in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of the winter. Despite the federal moratorium in place to prevent evictions and foreclosures, thousands are taking place each day because renters aren't meeting requirements or landlords refuse to participate. That's why these protesters, many of them with Indianapolis's Socialism and Liberation Party, think the government needs to take bolder action. What we're calling for is for the government to not just keep delaying evictions and keep extending the moratorium on evictions, but to seriously cancel all rents. I asked organizer Noah Leininger what he would say to those who would dismiss the idea altogether as impractical and impossible. There are things that might look impossible or improbable right now, but you know, circumstances change and all of a sudden those are demands that are very real, very practicable and necessary. Addiction and homelessness is a complex issue in this country and these protesters feel like our government could step in and handle it, especially during this pandemic. It's time to say enough is enough. In the richest country in the world, nobody should be unhoused. Nobody should be facing eviction. Working for you, Cornelius Hawker, WRTV. Local groups have been working to make sure those facing eviction know how to fill out a CDC declaration form and check to see if they meet the requirements. You can learn more at WRTV.com. And on Monday, the Indianapolis City County Council is introducing a proposal to deploy nearly $29 million in rental assistance. We will let you know what happens there. Now to the latest in the pandemic in Indiana. You can see from this graph, hospitalizations are starting to show a steep decline compared to November and December. As of yesterday, there were 1,725 COVID patients in hospitals across the state. That's the fewest since October 29th. COVID-19 is responsible for at least 9,549 deaths in Indiana. WRTV is helping loved ones share the faces, names, and stories of those Hoosiers. It was me and Lena from the age of, I was seven, she was eight, until she passed away. Levia Hefner says that she and her sister Lena spent time in foster homes together when they were young. From then on, they were inseparable. Now Livia must go on without her sister by her side. She says Lena struggled with asthma and started having trouble breathing last March. That and other symptoms prompted a trip to the hospital where she tested positive for COVID-19. Livia says her sister's health went downhill from there. The last thing she said to me was take care of my son. And she said, don't be scared. She said, because I believe in God. And she said, if God ready for me, she said, that's where I'm gonna be. Two weeks later, Lena Hefner died. She, that was last April. She was 44 years old. If you lost a loved one to COVID-19 and would like to share their story, contact us at facesofcovid at wrtv.com.
Around 127,000 people in Indiana are fully vaccinated for COVID-19, but for many, access can be an issue. Several organizations are helping people overcome barriers to get vaccinated, and that includes local libraries. People who do not have internet access or who would just like help navigating the system can call or visit more than 230 participating libraries across the state. The Johnson County Public Library system has already helped around 150 people make appointments after about a week. Workers say the response from the community has been overwhelmingly positive. So thankful because they don't know how to use computers. They don't know where to go. They want to see if maybe we can get them in quicker at a different clinic. And they're all, whoever thought this up is great. I'm so glad you're doing it. We're just so grateful. Statewide, libraries have scheduled appointments for more than 1,300 Hoosiers. Right now in Indiana, anyone age 70 or older, long-term care residents, first responders, and health care workers are eligible for the vaccine. You can register by going to ourshot.in.gov or by calling 211. A new vaccine could soon be on the market. Johnson & Johnson says its version of has benefits that the others do not. ABC's Rena Roy explains how it compares to the vaccines that are already available. The third vaccine in the fight against the pandemic now within sight. Johnson & Johnson's faster to make, easier to store one-shot vaccination could be weeks away. The company releasing phase three data showing it's 66% effective compared to Moderna and Pfizer's 95% effectiveness. It's 85% effective against severe disease and it's up to 100% effective at preventing hospitalizations and deaths. I know the 66% is what people are going to focus on, but this vaccine really does prevent severe disease, uh, the feared complications of hospitalizations and deaths. I think this is great news. Dr. Anthony Fauci, who warns the highly contagious UK variant could be the main strain in America by March, also throwing his support behind the vaccine. This has important potential and real implications, both domestically and globally, because as many of you are aware of, this is a single shot vaccine in which you start to see efficacy anywhere from seven to 10 days following the first and only shot. The company plans to apply for emergency review authorization next week. The FDA could sign off on it by the end of February, which could ease the burden on vaccination demand. ABC's Wood Johnson is at a vaccination site in Queens, where one couple spent weeks trying to get an appointment. You spent an entire day online just trying to get an appointment? I've been spending weeks, weeks calling and calling it online until you just give up and you walk away. Others getting their shots early and unexpectedly. In Seattle, after a hospital freeze failed, health officials set up an overnight site and sent the word out to the community. I heard that it has to be used tonight. And I was like, tonight, tonight, <laughs> you know, so I took the opportunity. About four hours later, 1,600 shots were in arms. Zorin Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. As many small businesses struggle to stay afloat, some are getting help from local governments, from bookstores to boutiques and breweries. Businesses across Noblesville are getting grants from the city. 45 local establishments received up to $10,000 to meet immediate needs like payroll, rent, or buying more PPE. Shona Metzger, the owner of Lil Bloomer's Children's Boutique downtown, says the financial help gives her hope. The grant gave me a sense of relief as to um, whether or not we'll be able to stay open. I know at least with the grant that we just got from the city, we'll be able to stay open for a few more months. I mean, it, it definitely will cover, you know, a couple months of rent and utilities and things like that. So hopefully with the vaccinations and other things that are um, taking place, hopefully um, things will start start looking up. The application deadline for this second round of grants is closed. Businesses started receiving money this week. Coming up on WRTV, the GameStop stock market saga continues. Why the situation is sparking calls for investigations into online companies like Robinhood and Wall Street itself. And next, from the stage to the small screen, how one prominent Central Indiana theater is moving forward with its season as the pandemic keeps the curtain closed. Well, as theater lovers face another year of dark stages, a local group is working to make sure the shows go on. WRTV's Cameron Riddle explains how plays produced right here in central Indiana will arrive on your TV at home. 
2020 was the year of show cancellations and restrictions, but one month into 2021, and the Indiana Repertory Theater is aiming to make this year unlike any other. Unlike anything, I used to think, oh, you know, I've got enough experience now. Not that much is going to throw me. Mm -mm. Totally thrown top to bottom. It's been unbelievable. After 40 years in the theater business, artistic director Janet Allen is learning a new way to put on a show during a pandemic. The actors are still on stage, but the audience is at home streaming the show on their TV. Consider it the Netflix version of live action theater. We're asking the film crew to film a play. So it's not put together like a movie. It really is still like watching a, a production of a live play. That's our goal. While the pandemic has forced us all to adapt to the changing rules and regulations, not many theaters have adapted to streaming shows as quickly as the IRT. This year, many of the nation's stages will remain dark. And many of our peers around the country, Broadway, you mentioned, there's nothing happening on Broadway. There's nothing happening in about 80% of the regional theaters in this country. Going dark was not an option for IRT. Instead, they've opted to do virtual shows with a smaller cast as a way to keep actors and crew members working while also paying bills and maintaining their downtown theater space. $30 virtual passes will give families access to IRT's upcoming productions from the comfort of their home. Allen says after adjusting to COVID regulations, Zoom rehearsals, changing setups, and even learning about streaming rights, putting on a full production show in a pandemic isn't too far from normal. Except that it never opens to a live audience. And while we're making it, we're, of course, six feet distanced, we're masked, we're doing all the sanitizing, and we're doing a lot of testing to keep everybody safe. Cameron Riddle, WRTV. Well, uh, double, uh, excuse me, IRT's next production is Tuesdays with Maury, which kicks off February 8th. The streaming pass is $30 and can be purchased at IRTLive.com. Now to an important update on an event that we previewed on Monday. The Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra will not perform tomorrow's concert with an audience. The orchestra stress, despite having a safety plan in place, it is yet to receive approval for an in-person crowd. The ICO will still put on the concert called Happy Birthday Mozart for a virtual audience. For ticket information, go to icomusic.org. A big weather event that we're watching move in over the weekend is the snowfall and heavy amounts in some areas. Meteorologist Kevin Gregory is tracking what's in store. Hey, Kevin. Some watching with excitement, ready for some snow, perhaps the biggest snow of the season in some spots north of Indy. Others of you would rather it kind of miss us. We'll wait and see here. Temperature 25 in Kokomo, 26 in Bloomington. It is a dry Friday night. It will be dry the first half of tomorrow. It's the evening hours where we really ramp everything up heavy snow at times Saturday evening and Saturday night as I mentioned about 5 to 1 a.m. I think is the time period where we'll see most of this accumulation in the 3 to 7 inch range north of Indy that sounds like a large range but I'll explain that more in a second let's just look at four different model forecasts for Indianapolis the range from about two to five and a half the five and a half is the outlier but as you go just north of Indy I think that's where it steps up and there'll be a fine line where this remains all snow, that's the greatest potential to eke out four to maybe seven inches of snow. That would be from Lafayette over to Frankfurt, Tipton, Kokomo, Delphi, Logansport, over toward Marion and Muncie and Richmond North, where we change over to rain for a period of time. That rain snow line will drift to the north. That will cut down on snow totals in the metro area and then very little to maybe two inches as you get to our south. What will accompany the snow tomorrow? An increasing southeast wind. It will gust to about 30 miles per hour. When the heavier snow is falling, visibility will be an issue. But the snow will be a heavy wet snow, so I don't think it'll be blowing around once it gets to the ground. Temperatures during the day tomorrow above freezing. They'll start coming down once the snow settles in. 3 o'clock, there's the expansion by 7. Widespread snow uh, from Indy north. As you go south, you begin to see uh, that transition 
transition to rain. And then as we go overnight into Sunday morning, the rain snow line comes well north of Indianapolis. But what will happen on Sunday is we'll turn it the other way. We'll have rain early in the day, switching to snow as the storm system pulls away. Sunday morning to Sunday afternoon and then Sunday evening, there's the wave of snow that comes back into the picture as the storm system pulls away. Monday through Wednesday dry. That'll be a much needed dry stretch. Temperatures zoom back into the 40s, but as the temperature comes up, our rain chances come up with the Thursday storm system. Mark. Kevin, thank you. WRTV's Hiring Hoosiers is steering you to one industry that is thriving during the pandemic and one company that needs more than two dozen new workers. No experience necessary. Overhead Door specializes in garage doors and insulation. Managers say the coronavirus pandemic never slowed them down since home and office construction remained an essential industry and home sales continued. With roughly 150 employees serving Indianapolis and central Indiana, the business needs to add about 25 to 30 new workers in its insulation division. You would install insulation in new construction homes and apartments. Overhead Doors provides the paid training program. When I came into the door at Overhead Door, I was just looking for a job to get me by. After I got out of training, which was about six to eight weeks, I realized the kind of money on um, piece rate that I could make. So um, I've been with the company for a total of 27 years now, and it has provided, this job has provided everything that you could want. Paid training starts at $14 an hour and wages go up from there. If you'd like to learn more about the long list of benefits or to apply, we've provided a link to Overhead Door in this story at HiringHoosiers.com. The battle between Wall Street and Main Street continues. Shares of GameStop soared again today after trading restrictions were lifted. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze reports popular companies like Robinhood are facing scrutiny for imposing restrictions in the first place. The stock market frenzy continues with GameStop capturing the attention of Wall Street and Washington. It's been a fun, fun ride to at least to, to feel like you're a part of the, the Wall Street system. It started as an effort by retail traders to band together and buy shares of struggling companies like GameStop to boost their stock prices at the expense of powerful hedge funds that had shorted the stocks betting against the companies. GameStop shares have soared nearly 1,700% in recent weeks. But the stock moves and restrictions on trading by the popular online brokerage Robinhood have now prompted an investigation by the New York Attorney General, a class action lawsuit, and calls for more regulation in Congress. The stock market in America has become nothing more than a glorified casino. So we need to reinvigorate the SEC as a regulator of the stock market. Today, shares of GameStop surged after trading restrictions were lifted by online brokerages, including Robinhood. The app took the unusual step of limiting trading in some stocks, including GameStop, on Thursday. Robinhood CEO telling CNN the move was necessary to protect customers in a volatile market. We're in a historic situation where there's a lot of activity and a lot of buying concentrated in a relatively small number of symbols that are going viral on social media. But the decision sparked outrage among Robinhood customers. Some were unable to buy additional shares, while other Wall Street investors continued trading. On Capitol Hill, some called it a display of the massive divide between Wall Street and Main Street and demanded more regulation. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez tweeting, This is unacceptable. We now need to know more about Robinhood app's decision to block retail investors from purchasing stock, while hedge funds are freely able to trade stock as they see fit. The SEC said in a statement today it's reviewing recent trading volatility in stocks like GameStop and it vowed to protect retail investors. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. It was a busy night on the hardwood. WRTV's Brad Brown starts our hoops coverage with the Pacers on the road. 
Back end of a Pacers-Hornets doubleheader in Charlotte on Friday night. Indiana fell behind as many as 14 points, but a strong fourth quarter brought them back in it. Malcolm Brogdon's three, even the game at 94 all. He scored 21, just three of 10 shooting behind the arc. Brogdon also had eight assists, finds DeMontis Sabonis on the move, game tied again at 96 all. Sabonis led the Pacers scoring with 22 points. Miles Turner would give Indiana their first lead since the first quarter. Turner also scored 20, had eight rebounds to go with it. Charlotte's Cody Zeller played one of his best games of the season. Back-to-back -back buckets put the Hornets back in front by two. 12 points and six rebounds for Zeller. Pacers would pull in front one more time. Jeremy Lamb's three with 90 seconds to go had them back in front by one. But Charlotte would answer with back-to-back -back threes in the final minute. The Hornets hit 16 triples in the game. The Pacers could not convert late, 108-105 when it was all done. Charlotte had six score and double figures. They get the split for the two-game set. Charlotte wanted to come out tonight and really push it down the floor and, and attack us in transition. They had us back on our heels there just for a little bit, and that's part of it. We were kind of, you know, reacting to what they were doing instead of, you know, anticipating and, and being ready for what was coming. Pacers are home against the 76ers on Sunday evening. Rachel Nichols spent the last NBA season in the Orlando bubble. She's the daily host of The Jump on ESPN, and tomorrow night she'll be courtside for Saturday primetime on ABC. I had a chance to talk with her about the upcoming games. Saturday night now, Lakers Celtics gets this thing started for you. Uh, it still feels like that these Saturday night games, It's this is the marquee every week. As you've seen this first part of the season with so few fans in the arena, though, do these games still have kind of the buzz that they're generating? I get the sense that a lot of them do. I really think they do. And I'll be honest, I was skeptical about that going in. I was really worried. I said, ah, these buildings are going to be empty. It's not going to be built like the bubble where they had giant television screens and those virtual fans and all of the projections because they knew they would have no fans the entire time. So they could really build around that. And, and I worried that especially too with squads where maybe some of the guys were missing doing coronavirus or contact tracing, it would really start to feel like a rec league scrimmage. But the truth <laughs> is that hasn't happened. Lakers Celtics starts it off tomorrow night. NBA count down at 8, the game at 8.30. It'll be followed by the news at 11. Time for some Friday high school hoops. Here's Dave Marin. Up to Greenwood tonight to see the 9-2 and two Woodmen take on 8-5 and five Perry Meridian. Right out of the gate, Rashad Elkham hits the 3 from up top. Then Charles Brooks from the corner. Greenwood would be up early and have coach Mark James rethinking his game plan. Out of the T.O., Perry Meridian's Reggie McDonald the steal. Up to Jaden Taylor for the dunk. Then on the next possession, Taylor the steal, and he finishes with another dunk. But down the stretch, the Woodmen had their shots falling. Here, Brooks from the other corner for three, and Greenwood would go on to win tonight 43-37. to Over to Decatur Central as the Hawks were entertaining 12-1 playing field tonight. The Quakers' Carl Vanderbush the turnaround jumper as they would build the double-digit lead most of the game. But then the Hawks caught fire. The great pass here to Brandon Smith as he lays it in. Then Casey Berry drives and scores. The fans enjoying the comeback as Berry continues to drain shots. But in the end, it would just be too big of a lead to overcome. Plainfield holds on to win 61-52. Dave Marin, WRTV Sports. Probability of seeing four inches of snow or more is greatest from Monticello to Kokomo down to uh, Anderson, Muncie, and Richmond North. It drops as you come south of that. Should see widespread heavy wet snow by the time we get from, say, four to seven. That continues through 11. That's probably the most uh, intense period, I guess I'd say. Mark? Of course, stay with WRTV and the WRTV app for the latest on the forecast and catch up with Nicole Griffin for WRTV News Weekends. Have a good night.